and and I think that's now. So again, welcome everybody. Um, this is the Paul Rosen Constitutional Law Speaker Series. Um, especially excited to have everyone here today. This series was established by Bernie Mandel, Barry Waldman, and Bob Garvey to commemorate Paul Rosen 64 and his passion for constitutional law. Paul was a longtime plaintiff's lawyer and civil rights attorney. He was a well-respected teacher and lecturer. He loved the law and loved to share it with others. And so every year we honor his spirit by having a, a distinguished speaker on constitutional law to come and share with you. This year, I'm especially proud and excited to welcome Garrett Epps. Multi-talented, he is a law professor, nonfiction author, and novelist, recently stepped down from a teaching position at the University of Baltimore Law School, but he is still the Atlantic Online Supreme Court correspondent. He was a staff writer for a bunch of other publications, including the Washington Post, the New York Times, wrote for the New York, New York Review of Books, The Nation, The New Republic, The American Prospect. He's the author of a whole bunch of books, including To an Unknown God, Religious Freedom on Trial, Democracy Reborn, The 14th Amendment and the Fight for Equal Rights in Post-Civil War America, Wrong and Dangerous, 10 Right-Wing Myths About the Constitution, and American Epic, Reading the U.S. Constitution. Um, three of his books were finalists for the ABA's um, Silver Gavel Book Awards. Um, I'm going to welcome, we're going to welcome questions during the lecture. Um, so we're gonna have a Q&A after the talk. I'm gonna ask that you submit questions via the chat function there on the bottom of your screens. The talk today is called Gödel's Prophecy, How the Constitution is Being Remade as an Authoritarian Instrument. And as they say, without further ado, I give you Professor Garrett Epps. Thanks, Zahn. Uh, my friend, the late Judge uh, David Schumann of the Oregon Court of Appeals used to respond to such generosity by thanking the introducer for that generous and almost correct introduction. Uh, but your introduction was generous and correct, and I appreciate it. And I want to thank you uh, in particular and the faculty and students of Wayne State University Law School for this invitation. Uh, I feel particularly indebted to Wayne Law and particularly sad that this occasion did not involve an actual visit because it's the past or present home of two valued friends. C.J. Peters was my colleague at Baltimore for 12 years and has now gone on to the University of Akron Deanship. And Steve Winter, of course, whose uh, scholarship always inspires me to to be a bit more rigorous. Um, having spent the last 12 years in Washington, DC, I'm also acutely aware of the Levin Center, uh, a, an invaluable resource for policymakers and journalists. And I will not directly admit to having stolen from their webpage uh, about government oversight litigation. Uh, finally, uh, I want to echo what John said and thank uh, Mr. Mindel, Mr. Waldman, and Mr. Garvey, who endowed this lecture series, uh, reading the career of their friend, the late Paul Rosen. I think that Wayne Law has much to be proud of in his career and his loyalty to the institution, and I have to say that I am honored to be considered worthy to give a lecture endowed in his name. My topic, as John said today, is Gödel's prophecy, how the US Constitution is being remade into an authoritarian instrument. And I want to explain the reference to Gödel. Kurt Gödel, who lived from 1906 until 1978, was probably the greatest mathematical logician since Aristotle. He uh, is known today for what's called Gödel's incompleteness theorem, which is actually consists of two demonstrated propositions um, that are quite significant to theoretical math today. Uh, now, as a lawyer, I am almost certainly going to do violence to the concepts behind these 
Gödel's theorem, but it's significant to the subject, so I'm going to try to summarize them. Uh, the first is that any adequate formal mathematical system must contain at least one equation that can neither be proved or disproved using the rules of the system. Simply sits there, not true or not true. No adequate form, this is second, no adequate formal mathematical system can be shown within its own terms to be consistent with itself. Another author summarizes it a bit more breezily, saying, one, if a logical or formal system is consistent, it cannot be complete. And two, the consistency of the assumptions in a system cannot be proved within the system. In other words, Gödel showed us that there is no mathematical system that does not, at some point, depend on assumptions from outside. Now, please be assured, uh, and please you know, come back. Uh, that ends the actual mathematical content in my uh, speech. Uh, what I want to talk about now is what happened when Kurt Gödel met the United States Constitution. Gödel was uh, Austrian by birth. He was Jewish. And at the age of 33, he was forced to flee from Austria. Uh, the West at that time, the Western route was closed to him. So he took the Trans-Siberian Railway to Vladivostok, then to Japan, then by ship to San Francisco and by train to Princeton, New Jersey, where he took up residence at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton. Albert Einstein was already there, as you know. There was a 27-year difference in their ages, yet the two men became such close friends that Einstein used to tell people he had accepted the post at Princeton only for the honor of walking Girdle home at the end of the day. Einstein became a naturalized U.S. citizen in 1940. In 1947, at Einstein's urging, Gödel did the same. At that time, an applicant for naturalization had to pass a test of knowledge of American government and constitution and have an interview with a federal judge. Gödel lacked the ability to take any intellectual task lightly. He threw himself into his constitutional studies, preparing for the interview which took place in Trenton on December 5th, 1947. Einstein and their mutual friend, Oscar Morgenstern, the mathematical economist, picked Gödel up that morning to take him to his interview, where they found him in a state of great agitation. He had studied the Constitution all night, he told them, and had discovered a contradiction, a flaw in it that would allow it to be converted into a dictatorship. He thought this was sufficiently important that he wanted to alert the judge at his interview so the authorities could fix this flaw. Einstein and Morgenstern both felt that such a warning might give a judge serious question, not only about Gödel's fitness for citizenship, but his fitness to be walking around unattended. Gödel was a very eccentric intellect. Among other things, he told people that since mathematics had no use for natural science, he did not believe in natural science. Uh, in order to forestall him from creating a scene at the interview, Einstein apparently began to tell a series of rather ponderous physicist jokes. But Gödel was not known for his sense of humor and he kept returning obsessively to the grave danger to the Republic that he had detected and how important it was that the judge be alerted. When at last they reached the chambers of District Judge Philip Foreman, the judge himself was overcome to see Einstein, whose naturalization he had presided over seven years before, and really basically took the position uh, that any friend of Einstein's was a citizen of his. 
Um, they, he did ask Gödel a few pro forma questions about his background. Gödel told him he was from Austria, but it had to leave. Uh, and uh, the judge said, well, that is because you were under an evil dictatorship. Fortunately, that is not possible in America. Uh, apparently, this moment was like an old bit out of the Three Stooges, where someone says Niagara Falls to Mo, and he goes Niagara Falls, you know, and, and turns uh, and, and reacts uh, very dramatically. Uh, Girdle began pouring out his worry about the Constitution flaws. On the contrary, I know exactly how it can happen here, he said. Einstein and, and Morgenstern, meanwhile, were signaling to the judge. And uh, the judge quickly said, there's, there's no need to go into that here. Uh, raise your right hand. And swore girdle in as a citizen. Now, there are many wonderful things about this story. The most poignant one is that neither Einstein nor Morgenstern actually seem to have found out exactly what Gödel's flaw was. So Gödel's constitutional incompleteness theorem is itself incomplete. Uh, to this day, we don't know what gave rise to his grim prophecy. I am no mathematician, but I am a constitutional scholar. And I can say that the US Constitution contains a lot of flaws, or perhaps incompletenesses, that create openings for authoritarianism. Like the mathematical systems Gödel studied, the result of the Constitution, democracy, can be operated, embodied in the Constitution, but it can't be generated or created by it. The system itself is inadequate to create a free system of self-government without a pre-existing commitment to some democratic norms. Now, most Americans like Einstein and Morgenstern would rather not hear about this incompleteness. Those of us who suffered through eighth grade civics are trained to say that the Constitution has separation of powers and checks and balances. It all comes out in one breath. This makes it impossible for the flywheel of democracy to come off its axle. James Russell Lowell, the poet and abolitionist, ironically noted in 1888, after our Constitution got fairly into working order, it really seemed as if we had invented a machine that would go of itself. And this begot a faith in our luck that the Civil War but momentarily disturbed. After one million deaths, as Lowell said, Americans rather quickly returned to the antebellum faith, first enunciated by Harper's Weekly in 1856, that a special providence watches over children, drunkards, and the United States. The Constitution is a big part of the special providence that people believe in. Many Americans retain a belief that the Constitution was in some way sent to us from heaven, that it was what Catherine Drinker Bowen in, 19, in 1966 called the miracle at Philadelphia. We tend to believe that the very words, the, the bare text of the Constitution will save us from danger. That's a peculiarly American idea. And I think it stems from another peculiarly American idea. And that is the belief, stretching back at least to the Second Great Awakening, that the Christian Bible itself of its own force is the engine of salvation. That is, if one merely reads its words, one can attain spiritual salvation without a need for liturgy, ecclesiastical hierarchy, apostolic ministry, or systematic theology. We recently learned that this belief extends even further among some embattled politicians who think that political salvation lies in merely holding the book aloft as the tear gas fumes disperse. Here's a contemporary example expressing this constitutional faith, written by the syndicated columnist Kathleen Parker and published on November 4th, 2016 in the Washington Post, under the headline, relax, we'll be fine no matter who wins. Thanks to the brilliance of our tripartite government, she wrote, nobody gets to be dictator. 
If Trump wins, he'll be held more or less in check by the House and Senate because that's the way our system of government is set up. Not even Republicans are eager to follow Trump's lead. There won't be a wall. He won't impose religion-based immigration restrictions. He'll dress up and behave at state dinners. He won't nuke Iran for rude gestures. He and Vladimir Putin will hate each other. Now, it's hard to believe any thinking person actually believed that. In fact, I think there's reason to think that many writers, many publicists, repeat this sort of piety because they think it's what audiences want to hear. I say that in this case because only a month after writing the above, Parker was back in print, desperately begging Trump's electors to block his uh, installation in office. She said his demonstrated lack of judgment and impulse control should send shivers down the spines of all Americans. Electors are scheduled to meet December 19th. If there are 37 Republicans among them with the courage to perform their moral duty uh, and protect the nation, a new history of heroism will be written, please be brave. We're now nearly 75 years on from Girdle's prophecy and nearly four years on from Parker's prophecy. We have lived through almost a full constitutional term of unremitting assault on constitutional norms and on the very idea of constitutional democracy. The news isn't as bad as it could be, but it isn't good. The brilliance of our tripartite government has in large part failed to restrain the administration's authoritarian projects. Now, I'm not going to go into a detailed account of the Trump administration's constitutional sins. For those of you who want a good one, the famed historian Michael Klarman has written a 242-page foreword to the Harvard Law Review's Supreme Court issue entitled The Degradation of American Democracy and the Court. In that article, are, is a handy 22-page close-packed law review type catalog of every constitutional violation that Klarman was able to detect. It's as good a summary as I have ever read and somber reading, and even more so since as I read it, the ghost of Girdel was whispering in my ear that even this list cannot be complete. And this is only Trump's first term. He and those around him have been to some extent restrained by the need for re-election. I honestly have trouble imagining the constitutional horrors that await us in a second Trump term. I have made a very incomplete attempt at that and will reference it later. How did we go from where we were? The sunny optimism, the miracle at Philadelphia, the idea of America as a special chosen nation to this Saturnine gloom, the spectacle of constitutional failure lowering at us only 60 days away. Going back to Girdle, it's because the constitution is incomplete. Some of that incompleteness was avoidable. It reflects a failure of craft by the framers. But if you've ever studied the constitutions of other democracies, written in much more deliberative circumstances by experts with much more commitment to completeness than ours was, you realize that incompleteness is unavoidable. No constitution, no matter how update, up to date, no matter how complicated and thorough, can operate without outside assumptions what Gödel would have called axioms, meaning statements whose truth must be taken as self-evident or simply assumed. They can't be proved from within the mathematical system. They precede and define it. The Constitution operated under shifting axiomatic backgrounds over American history, and the axioms informing it have shifted in a particularly malign way over the past half century. Now, democracy as a term is not subject to close definition. But as a word, it, it functions on the Potter-Stewart principle that we know it when we see it. 
any democratic system, I think, requires a few basic axioms, which I think uh, we all probably could agree on. The equality of each individual person, the binding nature of uh, individual rights, law is a construct that restricts the sovereign as well as the ruled self-government by representatives chosen in free and fair elections. But beyond those, the U.S. Constitution can only function to produce a democratic outcome if we employ certain specific outcomes in its application. And I want to take the briefest of tours through the text to uh, highlight where I think the axioms or interpretive assumptions have changed over the past 50 years. If we take a look at Article 1, axiomatic to that, it seems to me, is a vision of a powerful legislative body sitting at the center of the constitutional regime. Article 1 is 2,000 words long. It provides details of the elections and organizations of both houses, procedures, powers, uh, clearly in an attempt to be exhaustive and also, uh, in a way, the most poetic part of the original Constitution. Congress is given very, very serious powers. And if that's not enough, the people, using Article 5, have added to those powers in the 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th, 17th, 19th, 23rd, and 24th Amendments. The, the axiom of, of Congress as the central part of the government, it seems to me, is crucial. And over the past 50 years, a, a legal and constitutional philosophy has arisen that directly undermines this and that views Congress as a scornful and perhaps tertiary part of the government. Dean Kenneth Starr, a former independent counsel, wrote a book explaining that in his judgment, the United States Supreme Court is the no most important institution of government. The executive exists to carry out the court's will, and the Congress exists in order to write the court's concepts into legislation. That's pretty extreme, but I think if you follow the U.S. Constitution, or if, God help you, you are sentenced to sit in the same room with the justices for 10 years as I have been, you can see that the idea that con a, an act of Congress pr is presumed to be constitutional, which was an axiom, is no longer applicable. Congress is an object of scorn on the part of the executive and the judges. Part of that arises from a change in the axiomatic background of Article II. Throughout most of American history, it was axiomatic that the president had powers shared with Congress, that he was accountable, he or she was accountable to Congress and limited by Congress's enumerated powers. And finally, that the take care clause imposed a duty on the executive to act within a framework of legality and justify executive actions. In terms of constitutional doctrine, that has begun to change during the second half of the Reagan administration. When the ideologues like Ed Meese and Robert Bork, who were part of the Reagan project of constitutional renovation, offered the claim, extremely novel in the history of American constitutionalism, that the original intent or original understanding or original public meaning of Article II was actually to create and empower an office so clearly modeled on the monarchy of George III that the framers actually saw no need to write its powers down. That's only a slight exaggeration. And the result has been the gradual absorption of certain functions into the executive that seem unquestionably to be part of the legislature. This has happened, lest you think that I am uh, singling out this administration, this has happened under presidents of both parties 
since at least 1980, and it creates a kind of vicious circle. The president sidelines Congress. Congress reacts to the sidelining by posturing and proclaiming that it will do terrible things which it lacks the ability or the will to do. The president is encouraged in the contempt that this in, uh, engenders to take more powers and so forth and so on. It has reached a remarkable zenith under the Trump administration. Trump's attack on Syria without congressional authorization and his usurpation of the power of the purse to build his wall, both exemplify the new axiom being propounded for the interpretation of Article Two, And this comes from the president himself, a profound constitutional thinker. I have an Article Two, and it says I can do whatever I want. I, I wish that statement were farcical. It's far too close to true. In Article 3, the axiom for many years was that the law binds the government as well as the citizen, and that when they meet in court, the government and the individual are treated equally. The axiom was what is carved over the Supreme Court's entrance, equal justice under law. We are in a period of rapid change on the federal bench, instability in federal doctrine, and we have a hard right block of four justices on the court who would, I believe, vote to uphold a Trump executive order abolishing the Boy Scout oath. This axiom has decayed almost past saving. And the new axiom seems to be that courts facilitate, uh, exist to facilitate the operation of government and make sure the executive gets its favorite outcome. The First Amendment has undergone a remarkable shift. For a long time, it seemed axiomatic that free speech was a social good protected for everyone, like parks. The different freedoms laid out in the amendment assembly, petition, speech, and press were part of a continuum of civic participation, the property of every citizen. Beginning in the 80s and moving forward through the era of Citizens United, the new axiom is that free speech is a commodity like any other. It can be owned and deployed by massed wealth. There is no antitrust law in speech, or it can be under the government speech doctrine, a prerogative of government, not subject to any legal or constitutional check as it is deployed against the citizenry. The only fully protected speech is speech that the speaker, him or herself, can fund. As for assembly, petition, and press, these are viewed as at best marginal, at worst dangerous. The project of changing the libel laws that undergird our free press is quite a serious one. It has now begun to attract support on the Supreme Court. It will take on added urgency in a second Trump term. Then we have almost as a mirror image the Second Amendment. Now, you know, the Second Amendment is extremely hard to understand. I uh, wrote a book about the text of the Constitution and uh, frankly confess that I'm baffled by it, the Second Amendment. I regard it more as a poem than a, than a legal uh, provision. But for a long time, whatever its individual aspects, the center of the right was seen as military as oriented toward uh, the militia, as a federalism provision designed to protect the state's abilities to maintain their own military establishments. The new axiom, which is really emerging quite rapidly, is that the Second Amendment is not only equal in importance to the first, in fact, it functions 
the way the First Amendment once did. Display and use of weapons in public is now po political expression. Violence or the threat of violence in civic life are to be expected and indeed welcomed as long as the right hands are holding the guns. Finally, the 14th Amendment, the most important single provision of the Constitution as it emerged from the Civil War. The 14th Amendment states its own axiom in Article One, in Section 1, Clause 1, all persons born or naturalized in the United States are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. This axiom is universal equal citizenship. No categories of citizenship, no stateless or rightless persons uh, existing in a subordinate status. This provision is under extremely powerful challenge. Again, the basic ideological work was done by people close to former Attorney General Meese. Uh, the Trump administration did not invent this idea, uh, but it has given it a very serious push, and I'll come back to that at the end of my talk. The point I'm making in this tour is that if you strip the Constitution of its context, its Republican and Democratic small uh, letter backdrop, you have fertile ground for authoritarian rule. And the hard work of stripping the context has been done over time by many, many intelligent people. Over a half century, political figures, conservative scholars, right-wing judges have created this new set of background assumptions. They have set the table for Trumpism. To achieve this sleight of hand, one of the tools is what I call bare textualism. That is to say, take the words, strip them of any historical or political context, read them out of context in the total document, and then impose your own meaning on it. I think a really powerful example can be found in one of the, the first signals that the year 2016 was going to be a year of constitutional breakdown. And that is the refusal by the Republican majority in the Senate to even consider a nomination sent over by the president to fill a vacancy on the Supreme Court. A number of scholars, myself included, said that the court had the duty under the Constitution to advise and consent. That did not mean it had the duty to approve the Garland nomination, it meant that it had the duty to provide serious consideration and most likely an up and down vote. But in fact, many legal scholars and media were quick to assure the public that the Constitution doesn't say, yes, yes, pinky swear, you have to do it. It just says to do it. And that meant that the Senate had no duty to do anything. Conservative professor Josh Blackman ridiculed the notion that, quote, Article I exposes some sort of good faith duty on Congress. That quotation is striking in its scorn for the idea of good faith constitutionalism. That scorn is a fundamental principle of Trumpism. The central point of bare textualism is this. If the Constitution doesn't say the government must do something, it can, for political advantage of a faction within it, do nothing. It also says that if the, if the government has the power to do something, it can do it for any reason. It need not explain. As the uh, uh, president never gets tired of saying, I have the absolute right to pardon anyone. I have the absolute right. There is no reason to read any statement of presidential or governmental power within a context of democratic values. Another example, which took place well before Donald Trump was a serious political candidate, occurred when Republicans in the, House of Cong uh, the Houses of Congress announced that 
if it would politically advantage them, they would cause the default of the United States on its sovereign debt. There are only two categorical, unmistakable prohibitions in the U.S. Constitution as I read it. The first is the 13th Amendment saying, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as punishment for crime of which the individual shall be duly, has been duly convicted, shall exist in the United States or any place subject to its jurisdiction. The second is in section four of the, of the 14th Amendment, which says the validity of the public debt of the United States shall not be questioned. But confident voices assured us that Congress has no duty to actually pay the debt, as long as it says it'll pay it at some point, default, particularly if politically useful to one faction, uh, is a perfectly rational constitutional choice to make. Again, these breakdowns, whether it is the uh, sovereign default or the uh, failure to provide constitutional consideration to the Garland nomination, this is not Trump. Trump comes later. Trump is not the cause of our problem. Trump is a, is a symptom. Now, what do we have to look forward to if there is a second Trump term? I, it's hard, I mean, uh, you know, summarizing any week of, of constitutional action in the last four years is almost beyond human capacity. But to think in terms of years sort of boggles my, my limited capabilities. I do have two uh, things that I think are particularly important to watch for simply because they've arisen in the context I work in. And the first is, I think we will see a powerful, determined, consistent assault on the idea of universal citizenship in the United States. As I say, the 14th Amendment's axiom is, is stated, but the, the administration, again drawing on scholarship that was sponsored by Attorney General Meese, explicitly denies that the words of the 14th Amendment mean what they say. President Trump has showed a good deal of interest in taking away citizenship from various disfavored groups of Americans, even before he was sworn in. He was proposing that flag burners lose their citizenship. He has discussed this in terms of professional athletes who don't honor the national anthem. Uh, his administration uh, has moved against citizens in a number of ways. Uh, a number of born birthright citizens born in the United States in the border area are finding that the government no longer recognizes their citizenship because it believes they have false documents. Um, the, the administration two years ago floated a balloon by means of an op-ed by a man named Michael Anton. Michael Anton is a political thinker if you haven't heard of him, I wouldn't feel all that bad. His major work has to do with what Niccolo Machiavelli would have thought of the business suit. But he is a former official of the Trump National Security Council, and he managed to persuade the Washington Post, my, my alma mater, which I'm embarrassed to admit in this context, to allow him to run an op-ed using altered quotations from the debates over the 14th Amendment to suggest that the president by executive order could simply strip the citizenship of millions, maybe as many as four millions or more of native born Americans because of the immigration status of their parents. This was met with a great deal of opposition, but I think we will see that executive order in a second term. In addition, the uh, administration has begun a project 
to denational, denaturalized many, many American citizens, some of whom have been citizens for decades because of technical flaws in their naturalization uh, applications or because of conduct they engaged in after being naturalized. Um, and finally, the intention of Immigration and Customs Enforcement to expand what is called expedited removal, uh, to, which is now confined to the border. That is to say, there are procedures by which if an individual is seized, basically crossing the border, not having really entered into American uh, society, uh, they, didn't, they don't need to be given the full panoply of uh, procedural rights that people present in the United States must be given before they can be deported. The administration is now intending to expand that to the entire country. And we will see raids by ICE on families, people who have been living in the United States for decades, and prompt deportation, uh, uh, which is something that's happened before in American history, uh, without any uh, procedural guidelines of people who have lived in the United States, worked here, and created families. It's going to be uh, a really scary point of view if you think citizenship uh, is important. And I think it's part of a larger cat uh, characteristic of authoritarianism, which is the desire to subdivide. It, it's commonly thought that dictatorships and authoritarian regimes sustain themselves by external conflict that you unite your population by having a, a foreign enemy. I actually think that it's much more common to, for authoritarian regimes to sustain themselves in power by conducting warfare against part of their own populations, not by spurring national unity, but by creating national disunity, excluding some people as aliens, subordinating others as unworthy of rights, uh, expelling some for racial or political reasons. And, you know, like a lot of really serious and sinister things, this has taken the form under Trump of a kind of comic opera, you know, it's, it's like a Charlie Chaplin movie. Uh, Trump has shown an interest in somehow getting rid of Puerto Rico with its 3.1 million uh, citizens of color and buying Greenland to make up for it with its 56,000 uh, residents, but its provenance as coming from Northern Europe, which is the place he frequently says, why can't we have more citizens from places like Denmark? The comic opera thought brings me to my, my final thought. Um, and that is, as I said at the beginning, to the extent that Trump has fallen short of his authoritarian ambitions, it's not because our system has such a genius that it resisted. It's simply that the man is not competent to carry out his plans. And the problem is that even if Trump were to exit the scene, the seeds of Trumpism, the seeds of authoritarianism are there in the axiomatic shifts that I've talked about earlier in this talk. We can imagine, and I could give you names, but I won't, uh, one of the less amusing members of the Republican Party becoming president four or eight years hence with a project of completing the work that Trump has begun, it seems to be it could easily be accomplished. Now, with luck, we will avoid this, this fate. The war of the axioms will have to be fought. And here is the thing that I find most poignant about Gödel's prophecy. It was uttered at a time when the international situation was quite dangerous, the dawn of the Cold War. But the internal politics of the United States were con considerably less chaotic than they are today. We can imagine someday that we may achieve a new normality in politics such that every presidential election is not seen by both sides as an existential threat to their existence or democracy itself. And I wistfully 
share an anecdote told by Einstein's collaborator, Ernst Gabor Strauss, who left Princeton for a post at UCLA. He, told, he wrote of his last conversation with his mentor, who died in 1955, and Strauss asked Einstein, among other things, how is Gödel? Einstein said, you know, I think Gödel has gone completely crazy. What do you mean, Strauss said? What could he have done? Eisenhower replied, he voted for Eisenhower. With profound nostalgia for a day when politics covered the spread between Eisenhower and Stevenson, I will open the floor for questions and observations. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That, that was wonderful. I want to remind um, folks that they can enter their questions in the Q&A. I'm going to pass on you know, one question that's been put forward here, which is what are your thoughts on the DOJ's actions in the E. Jean Carroll libel case? Um, <laughs> yeah, um, I, I think the idea that the president is operating within his official duties when he says that a woman is not his type I actually think from the Trump's point of view, that makes perfect sense. For the rest of us, it's nonsense. And I think that the decline of the Department of Justice um, under Attorney General Barr is one of the real tragedies, one of the lasting scars on our, our nation. Um, I can recall two things. One is that uh, at, at one of the first Federalist Society conferences, um, uh, at the first Federalist Society conference after the resignation of Attorney uh, General Sessions, uh, Sessions received an enthusiastic uh, standing ovation. And I said to one of my Federalist friends, as he then was, uh, what is the standing ovation for Sessions? And he said, well, he followed the law. And my answer was, he followed the law. He's the attorney general. He's supposed to follow the law. That's like saying he put on his trousers in the morning. But the truth is, I look back now at Sessions as a giant of legality. Uh, I knew many people who knew Attorney General Barr well. I've never met him. But they assured me before he was confirmed that he was an institutionalist. He respected the Department of Justice. He was known on, to lawyers on both sides. Uh, and that he would protect it. And instead, the dismantling of the Department of Justice as any sort of independent uh, uh, tribunal of law uh, is, is just breath breathtaking. I, I, I just think it is astonishing. And the fact is, you know, it's not just the squalor, the moral squalor of the uh, attempting to assume the E. Jean Carroll defense. You know, it's the fact that the man is willing to assert this with a straight face. And when I first taught civil procedure, Rule 11 was a lot tougher than it is now. And I, I regret the reforms that were put into it because I think that some serious sanctions should be sought in some of this uh, public litigation. I, I don't know if that's a direct answer, but that's the best I can do. I, I have a question here that I'm go I'm just going to to read out verbatim, and you yeah. can respond as you choose. The question is: Please name names of possible dangerous successors to the incumbent president. <laughs> no, <laughs> thank you. I think that um, you know one thing you might do. Uh, one thing you might do is read the very interesting list of possible Supreme Court appointments that has been floated by the White House in the past week. And it includes the names of some elected officials. Very interesting set of names. You might look at them and ask what thoughts those names inspire. Questioner writes, how do we combat a movement that seems to be fueled, again, I'm, I'm, I'm quoting here, that seems to be fueled by right-wing evangelicals that will vote for someone based only on talking points about religious liberties and anti-abortion, and who also turn a blind eye to everything wrong that Trump does. 
um, with the courts being packed with conservative justices who are young and will serve for a long time. Well, you, you've named two, uh, two very serious uh, problems that we have, one sort of social and the other specifically legal. Um, I personally think, you know, having uh, one of my first jobs was religion reporter, but uh, when back in before I went to law school, I personally think that there is and there exists a soul within, and when we say evangelicals, we mean white evangelicalism, because if you uh, look at the African American church, you'll see that its uh, political and social commitments are quite different. Um, I think that uh, the, the kind of monolith, political monolith of American white evangelicalism that was uh, began to be assembled by the late uh, Dr. Falwell uh, is showing serious signs of strain. The most recent, of course, involving the young Dr. Falwell, uh, or shall we say, Dr. Falwell and Mrs. Falwell. Uh, that is to say that the strain of accommodating itself to the demands of a fundamentally amoral regime uh, really are showing up among people who take seriously their, their commitment to the teachings of Jesus. Now, that's not everybody. And the authoritarian strain in American Protestantism has, uh, uh, you know, demonstrated itself. And these are people who feel uh, seriously threatened. They feel seriously threatened in the way that people feel who historically have considered themselves to be at the top of the social order being told you are simply equal to everyone else feels like subordination. And one of the things that you see when you read the briefs in the Supreme Court uh, about on these important religion cases is that if the government treats religious bodies the way it treats every other body, that is a, characterized as discrimination. If the government treats religious bodies separately, that is characterized as discrimination. The emerging rule is that religious bodies operate independently of the law when they want to. And there is significant support for that view on the court. Now, that brings up the second question, which is, how do we repair what's been done to our federal bench? And I have to say, if I were advising a new president, I would say in the words of Lady Macbeth, be bloody, bold, and resolute. That is to say, we have to do something like court packing. I say we, I mean the people who don't want to see a recurrence of authoritarianism because the courts have been politicized. The independent judiciary, of course, I didn't have time to go into this, but that was an axiom. Right, that, that judges are independent. We see Chief Justice Roberts still attempting to, to hold up that banner and being told, I, I mean, I never thought I would live to see a public dispute between the Chief Justice of the United States and the President in which the President basically tells the Chief Justice, you're wrong, shut up. If you go back and you study the 1937 crisis of the court, you will see that Chief Justice Stone and President Roosevelt were very careful never directly to address each other and always to speak of the other with respect. They were carrying out a war to the knife, but it was done within the protocols of a democratic system. That's not what's happening now. Uh, and uh, I think that there's very little question. And if you doubt it, you only have to listen to what comes out of the administration that the intent is to weaponize the federal bench and use it as an instrument of part partisan governance. This can be combated to some extent uh, by expanding the number of federal judges. I think there's a good case for doing that anyway. Uh, and I think that uh, if a new administration doesn't do that, it may be sealing its own death warrant. And that very possibly includes changes in the makeup of the Supreme Court. Uh, a number of people, including my son, Dan Epps, have proposed various uh, remedies for this. And 
I have not signed on to any particular one, but I do think it is a problem. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt lost that battle, which cost him dearly. I am not sure a new president can afford to lose the battle because I think there are at least four justices on this court uh, who see themselves as having the task of ensuring that the Republican Party wins its favorite outcome. We've got a question you're writing in regarding Trump saying he will take away the citizenship of anyone who burns the flag. Can we seriously believe he meant what he said? Has he ever followed through with any of his threats? Isn't it true the media has created a Trump presidency because he says such outlandish things and then they make profits covering him? Well, as to the latter, I would say no. Um, I think that one of the things that's important is not to buy the idea that Trump's statements are not serious. Trump is a little bit like, uh, um, you know, I, I used to work uh, with various uh, homeless populations and, and you have to deal sometimes with people who are uh, very drunk and you can hear them working themselves up into a rage. And you know that if you don't intervene, somebody's gonna get a punch in the jaw. It may take an hour for the person to get there. That's what Trump does. He works himself up. If you see the way he keeps saying, open up libel laws, open up libel laws, all of a sudden we see on the court, Justice Thomas, who is a personal friend and frequent dinner guest at the White House, saying, we need to open up the libel laws. New York Times versus Sullivan was wrongly decided. Uh, when you see Trump saying, let's take away citizenship, please bear in mind that to people on the right, that's not such an outlandish idea. And I will, it is 9-11 today, and, and it's a, a very somber anniversary, and we all recall, but it's very useful to understand the entire history of the post-9-11 period. Uh, one episode from that period that has been forgotten because nothing came of it. Uh, we all know the USA Patriot Act was passed in the, in the very uh, rapid succession after 9-11. What's less remembered is that a year later, there was a leak from the Justice Department of what was called or codenamed Patriot II. And Patriot II was a draft statute that the administration apparently intended to introduce if there was another crisis that strengthened federal powers of surveillance and detention in a number of ways. One of the sections would have empowered the Attorney General on his own to remove the citizenship of any American born or naturalized who in his judgment adhered to a foreign terrorist organization. We're pretty much, you know, if, if that were to pass, we'd pretty much be there. We'd pretty much be the Soviet Union where citizenship stripping was a, a political weapon, a, a very important political weapon. And that was 18 years ago. So the fact that Trump says these things in a comical way, I think shouldn't disguise the menace underneath it. I think, uh, you know, if you ever go back and, and take a look at, at Mussolini's, films of Mussolini, Mussolini was a very serious thinker and a very serious figure in many ways. He was also a clown. He knew how to show off for the crowds. People liked him. They didn't take him as seriously as they might because he was a clown. Trump is a clown. But if you've seen uh, Stephen King's It, you know that clowns can be kind of dangerous. Uh, as far as the media, I think the media is doing what its job is, uh, that when the president says crazy things, it's not the job of reporters. I was a reporter for 15 years. It's not the job of reporters to pretend that didn't happen. It's not the job of reporters to say he didn't mean it. I am glad to say that the media or the, the, the significant ones are now at least willing to take on the task of saying the president made a false statement yesterday. But if you remember in the early years of the administration, they didn't even know how to do that. So I don't think that our crisis is caused by the media. And I don't think it's a mirage. I think it's, it's quite serious. And I think that Trump gives us warning when he wants to do something and it behooves us to pay attention. 
Questioner asks, do you think that a second Trump term would stimulate a brain drain of scientists, scholars, artists, and intellectuals from the US? Well, you know, I think that's certainly possible. Um, I, a friend of mine uh, texted me recently that, that by going through some old records, she had discovered that she is eligible for German nationality. And, you know, I thought first I had this kind of wistful sigh. And then I thought, you know, what irony of history is it now that, you know, you have someone saying, perhaps I can escape to the sanity of Germany, right? This is, this is a, a very odd h historical turn. I do think what you see and what you have already seen is slightly different in that the United States has profited, you know, to enormously from uh, a brain drain from the rest of the world. Uh, the absolutely brilliant scientists, the talented doctors, the entrepreneurs who come here from uh, all over the world uh, and enrich our national life in a number of ways, whether it's in tech or medicine or science or literature, that flow is being systematically choked off by changes in the visa rules uh, and by administrative uh, changes that make it much harder to acquire permanent residency and citizenship. And I think that we are in grave danger of forfeiting our scientific uh, and medical leadership in the world because we are just deliberately cutting ourselves off uh, from, from the source of our dynamism. Um, I myself have no alternate citizenship, so I guess I'm stuck here, uh, but I'm not sure everyone is thinking that way. Questioner asks, if November indeed turns the current president out of the White House and mm -hmm. ends Republican control of the Senate, you know, how much damage do you assess will nonetheless already have been done to our constitutional and political system? Well, I, I think that um, there are certain things that will need very serious attention. And I hope uh, if there is a new president, I hope that president uh, has the determination to address them. Uh, we talked about one that I think is very serious, and that is the, the demoralization, the decay, and the kind of political colonization of the Department of Justice. The, you know, the Department of Justice has functioned in a, even under presence of both parties has functioned in a very honorable way. The, the Civil Rights Division of the Department of Justice, as you know, was started by President Eisenhower. Uh, it was, uh, you know, expanded by uh, Attorney General Robert Kennedy, but it has continued to operate under presence of both parties. Uh, it has been seriously de demoralized. The independence of the uh, U.S. Attorney's offices uh, and obviously, when I use the term independence, it's a shorthand term. You know, it's the easiest thing in the world would be to say, what are you talking about? These are uh, presidential appointees. Nonetheless, they are con the, the offices are constructed uh, and have been treated in such a way as to give the message that criminal prosecution on behalf of the United States is something that does not follow the political preferences uh, of the White House. That has gone by the board. Uh, uh, you know, we all saw the episode involving uh, the U.S. Attorney in the Southern District. Um, this happened, has happened in the U.S. Attorney in, in uh, the District of Columbia. Uh, the, and so repairing the Justice Department, as President Carter did uh, after uh, Watergate, and as, uh, let me be generous uh, and correct, President Ford began that process. Uh, with Attorney General Levy, um, that, that that is going to be very, very urgent and also repair to our uh, national security apparatus, which has politically been colonized and compromised, I think, in ways that are now clear to everyone who followed the Trump um, uh, impeachment. Uh, intriguingly enough, and this is what I mean when I say that one of the, the protections that we have had is Trump's own incompetence, uh, Trump has gone out of his way to offend the military, uh, which I honestly think in its highest ranks cannot wait for him to depart. And if I personally were seeking to become dictator of a country, I would try to befriend those people. Um, 
And so I, I think that that uh, the independence, uh, the, the, the sort of non-political nature of the, of the military has been reinforced, not, not undermined um, by, by Trump. And then finally, you know, I think that to me, in some ways, the most alarming thing is that absolute certainty I have that within the next five years, we are going to see a series of decisions stating that the problem in America is not enough guns on the street. The problem in America is that we don't allow people to have enough assault weapons. The problem in America is that we don't allow enough high capacity magazines, that we deny the right to bear arms to people who have uh, demonstrated uh, mental uh, uh, illness. And the role of violence in our civil life, civilian life, which has uh, increased radically in the last four years. That genie is not easy to put back in the bottle. Um, the historian Jill Lepore, who writes for The New Yorker, once said, in a country where bearing arms in public is seen as citizenship, there is very little left of civilian life. And I'll tell you a story that happened to me uh, six weeks ago, I live in a small college town, Eugene, Oregon. Uh, when we began this lecture, the, the town was still standing. Um, and we live one block away from a very small pocket park uh, called Monroe Park. It has a nice sculpture and a playground and kids go there and play. One evening in July, we were sitting there uh, on a park bench watching little girls turn cartwheels when out of nowhere, we were confronted by 12 masked men carrying assault rifles who staked out a, a, a perimeter around the camp, the little the, the park. The little girls ran away, thank God. Uh, and they were there as security for a demonstration by a group that regards Black Lives Matter as too right wing, right? This was, I'm not, I don't want to, act as if this problem exists only on one wing, though I think it's on disorder. But we're seeing people arm themselves for civil conflict. And how you put, you know, I think there will be bloodshed on election day. I think there may be bloodshed uh, if, if the president is uh, held to have lost the election. Uh, and how you put that genie back in the bottle, I don't know. God knows law by itself is not sufficient to do that. We have a question from Professor Lance Gable, who asks, in what ways does the pandemic and the response to it either reflect or exacerbate the trends being discussed? If internal division is a key strategy pursued by authoritarians to main power, the stoking of divisions during the pandemic response and the use of politically based favoritism and access to response resources is one of the most troubling aspects of the federal response to the pandemic. Well, I, you know, I, I, I completely agree with that. Um, and I think that um, there, there's a couple of aspects to the constitutional legal part of the pandemic. One of the things I said that is, you know, offered as my own meager insight into authoritarianism is that it, it survives in part by conducting warfare against its own population. And I think that if you adopt that metaphor and ask yourself about the pandemic, you can see that happening, right? It, 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 at first, you know, we thought, well, the president just doesn't get it. He doesn't understand this is how serious this is. He really thinks it'll go away. This week we learned that's not true, that he always, he did understand long before anybody else. He simply chose to do nothing and lie about it. Um, we did then subsequently see, as, as the questioner says, uh, the, the very extensive personalized use of federal resources uh, to extort various uh, forms of political tribute from individuals. The president saying, you know, I'll send you masks when you thank me. Um, I, I don't recall ever having seen something like that before. But more to the point, we see this thing about, first of all, uh, as Jared Kushner apparently said in, in the White House uh, early in the pandemic that, oh, look, it's affecting blue states. 
We, we don't have to worry about it. Uh, it's not affecting our states. I mean, that is warfare. That is civil warfare, right? Um, and now we see the same kind of rhetoric being used about the civil disorders. That is Democrats, Democrat governors, Democrat states, blue states are the ones where people commit crimes and, and so forth, uh, and aren't really part of our country. Uh, so I think, I think those two, I think, you know, in that sense, sometimes you, you know, uh, Senator Biden or Vice President Biden is uh, a very calming influence when you see him. Perhaps sometimes you get too calm uh, when you see him. But I do think the extent to which he says, we need to stop this division, we need to address ourselves as part of one country. I think that's exactly right. Now, how you do that and how long it takes, uh, I don't know. We have a question here from Professor Steve Winter, who asks, is it, is it politicization of the courts, which began mm -hmm. with Adams, or is it the court's asserted supremacy that we should be worrying about? Well, I, I would say two things about that. You know, the first is judicial supremacy is definitely a problem. It, it is extra constitutional. It's very odd. Um, the, the roots of it, we, you know, it, it's a fairly polarized discussion if you ask, you know, where did this come from? Uh, uh, the, the second thing is that, you know, first of all, the politicization of the courts under Adams, let's not forget, was pretty damn dangerous. And in the election of 1800 really did bring the United States to the verge of civil war. Um, the Virginia militia was arming and preparing to march on Washington to install Jefferson by force uh, if the Federalist Congress refused. Um, so, you know, that was pretty serious. And in fact, you know, it, it abated somewhat. Um, but there's a difference. But the, the second thing is, of course, uh, judicial appointments have always been political in the sense that uh, you know, a, a federal judge is a lawyer who met a politician one time, is the old saying. Uh, but there is a difference between politicization and partisization. And the explicit ideology that the court is to be the organ of one party, that I think is relatively new. And you know, as has been pointed out before, if you look at the United States Supreme Court, this is probably the first time in history that you've had a five to four split of so-called liberals versus uh, hard right conservatives. And there is no Democrat in the conservative camp. There is no Republican in the moderate liberal camp. This is a strict party line vote. Uh, on the court. And I, I think that is dangerous. I don't know how we get out of it. Um, I, I kind of understand the efforts that are being made, at least by Justice Kagan and possibly by Justice Breyer, to kind of defuse this conflict. Um, but I do think it persists, and I do think it's, relative, it's new. It's, it's, it's different even from what came out of 1937, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and it's a real threat. Uh, to the independence of the judiciary. And hi, Steve, how are you? I'm, I'm going to stick on this for, for just a minute yeah. because I'm intrigued sure. by, by the comments about judicial supremacy. Can yeah. one decry judicial supremacy at the same time as one decries the failure of the courts to stand up to the Trump administration's agenda? Well, let me just say one thing. Let me back up and say one thing that most of the big cases uh, of the four year, the big Trump cases of the four, past four years have been uh, statutory cases uh, for which, you know, the question of judicial supremacy is it's a very different question. Courts exist to interpret statutes and, and make sure that that governments and individuals follow them. Uh, and the fascinating thing about the Trump administration has been its apparent determination to lose statutory cases that it could easily win, right? Mm -hmm. So in that sense, I, I, I think that you can say, no, I think the court was wrong about statute, the following statute. That's not saying 
the courts are supreme. I think that judicial supremacy is a slightly different thing that says um, that when, I mean, that, that expresses, you, you know, and the truth is, I don't think, I'm certainly not going to deny it. I don't think many people would deny it, that judicial supremacy to some extent is in the eye of the beholder. I grew up hearing that judicial supremacy was a threat to the Republic and the, the evidence that was adduced to me when I was a, a, a boy was that look at what they did with this school segregation stuff. They just made it up. It's, uh, you know, Plessy versus Ferguson was great. Um, I uh, came to, under, as I came to understand the world I was growing up in, it seemed to me that this wasn't judicial supremacy at all. It was just reading the constitution. Um, other people see, uh, you know, you see a case like Roe versus Wade. And I think that's a fascinating study but for two reasons, because one, there are two ways you can look at it, right? One way, which I believe to be true, is that a society in which women are put in jail for, uh, fel on felony charges for having an abortion is not really free, right? On the other hand, a, a society in which Justice Harry Blackman goes off to the Mayo Clinic Library and writes up the national rules for abortion from conception until birth has, is askew in some sense, right? You can, and, and in, in this sense, I, I suppose I'm echoing uh, then Judge Ginsburg, now Justice Ginsburg, who said, you know, the problem with Roe versus Wade was that it, it, it was judicial hubris. And I think we can see that all the time. I think that um, for the Chief Justice to say that the that Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act has to be stricken because in his judgment, congressional hearings were not adequate. I think that's pretty clearly on one side of the line. That's not statutory interpretation. That's the kind of invention of a constitutional principle. Um, I think that when you have courts saying, you know, we've just discovered this principle that the government can't make you eat broccoli, we need to look really carefully at the sources of that because they don't seem to me to be constitutional or legal. I am going to be very frank to say that, you know, I see this stuff from my point of view. Um, but I do think that there are times we can cite where the the court simply says the political process has produced one result. We don't like it. We are going to strike it down. Um, and that that's problematic. For, for something of a change of pace, we have a questioner mm -hmm. who asks, can authoritarianism be used for good considering there is so much partisanship in our country? Well, you know, I wrote a, I wrote a column some uh, for Halloween of last year, uh, which analogized the situation our country finds itself in to Hawthorne's famous short story, Young Goodman Brown. I don't know if you've read this, but it's a story of a young Puritan who goes out of Salem, Massachusetts in the 17th century. He's traveling through the woods and he comes upon all the people of his village, all the, go uh, the good wives and the godly men and the the minister and, and the president of the congregation gathered around an altar worshiping Satan and sacrificing and offering themselves to Satan. And then he wakes up, finds himself alone in the woods. And for the rest of his life, he doesn't know whether the dream was the reality or whether he imagined these depths of depravity. And we're living through our young Goodman Brown moment. All of a sudden, it's as if a voice has said, you know, you know the, the satanic motto, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. And I think that, that someone like Bill Barr, who had had a relatively distinguished career, someone like, you know, suddenly got the word, it's okay. You don't need to fuss with all that stuff anymore. Just do what you want. And as far as I'm concerned, history suggests that whatever good intentions 
you march into that mindset with, you know, as I wrote, there have been more remakes of this movie than A Star is Born, and it always ends the same way. So no, I, I think that democracy is both uh, the means and the end. Uh, and we want to make our system more democratic um, and uh, not less. Uh, and if we do, I think good outcomes will follow. We're nearing the end of our time. We, we have three more questions. And one, okay. of them is, one of them is from Professor Steve Calkins, who asks that if in the upcoming election, Democrats win the White House and both houses of Congress, would you support ending the filibuster? Uh, yes. You know, somebody got on my case about this uh, and not long ago and, and you know, said, well, you wouldn't say that. You know, you, you, when did you ever uh, say anything bad about the filibuster when Democrats were doing it? And I said to this person, and, you know, despite my genial exterior, I am capable of a, some surliness. I said, look, bub, can you tell me where you were on June 10th, 1964? I think the person probably wasn't born, but he certainly couldn't tell me. I said, I can tell you where I was. When I heard the news that the United States Senate had voted by two thirds to end the Southern filibuster on the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And I said, I trace my life as a citizen of a free society to that day. Growing up under segregation was not growing up in freedom. And as far as I'm concerned, you know, the filibuster is spinach and I say to hell with it. So the sooner we get rid of it, the better. And I think, you know, in the long run, regardless of who controls the Senate, it's possible it will give rise to a more responsible legislative process. But at any rate, I don't think we can let our response to climate change and other things like that wait on, you, you know, the, the whims of, of uh, 40 one Republican senators. I, I just don't. So yes. Yeah. And it's not in the Constitution. It's got nothing to do with the damn Constitution. You know, it just came. Aaron Burr, it's Aaron Burr's gift. Thank you so much. This, this, reminds, this reminds me of a question that I jotted down, but we're not going to have time to ask. But I'll, I'll just note that to the extent universal citizenship is a premise of the U.S. Con axiom of the U.S. Constitution, it's had a very short run, you know, maybe 1868 to 1879, and then sometime following um, 1954 to the present. But... Well, yes and no, because I think if you study the history of U.S. immigration and you study cases like Wong Kim Ark, it is certainly true that Wong Kim Ark, having been readmitted to the United States as a birthright citizen, did not enjoy equal rights. <laughs> but he didn't get shipped back to China either. They didn't you know, and, and to the extent when we have done mass deportation of birthright citizens, it's seen as a crime. It's understood. Apologies have been issued. Uh, if that principle were not there, I think we'd be in much worse shape. Equality, equal citizenship, and universal citizenship aren't always exactly the same. Mm -hmm. But if you can only have one, you should take one and not neither. Questioner wants to know, do you have predictions about the outcome of the November election? Oh, 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 oh no. <laughs> I was briefly a political reporter, and political reporters do nothing but give predictions. And I think the Kathleen Parker example I used is, shows what you do. If you're really good in that you predict both things, and then after one of them has to happen, and then afterwards you cite the prediction that was correct. Uh, I don't even predict uh, what the court's going to do. Uh, anymore. So, uh, no, I think we're going to live through a really hard and tense period of time, and I hope we come out of it okay. Last question in our waning moments asks about mm -hmm. Jane Meyer's dark money, which discusses many of the tactics, question the rights that were used to get here, um, building a farm system through the Federalist Society, conservative mm -hmm. think tanks and right-wing funded collegiate programs, donor network, Questioner asks, do you think there is anything we can learn or should adopt from these efforts um, in the work to fight them? Uh, absolutely, absolutely, I do. I think, um, you know, if we could get a whole bunch of billionaires, that would be fine, but that probably won't happen. I'm uh, on the board of the American Constitution Society, and we are attempting to do some of this kind of 
intellectual spade work for a future democratic administration, including identifying possible judicial appointments uh, and so forth. Uh, so, you know, yes, I think what people do on the ground in Michigan and Oregon and uh, uh, Virginia, uh, North Carolina, all the places that I've lived, uh, can be tremendously important, particularly if we need to make change rapidly. So, yes, get involved. And, uh, you know, we don't have, the, you know, the Koch brothers, we don't have them. Okay. So we'll do without them. All right. So, so we, are, we are at the end of our allotted time. Um, this has been terrific. I want absolutely to, to thank Professor Epps, to thank the family of the late Paul Rosen, to thank um, Bernie Mandel, Barry Waldman, Barb Go Bob Garvey, all of the contributors um, to the Paul Rosen Speaker Series Endowment. And finally, to thank um, all of you in the audience. Um, this has been great. And um, we're going to end this series, I guess, for another year. And um, thank you all so much.